Hyponatremia, one of the more confusing topics that doesn't need to be that way. We know how to define it to sodium less than 135, but the question remains, why is this so important to know and why is it hammered in our heads all the time? And the answer lies in the equation for serum osmolality. When you look, you have two times the sodium plus glucose over 18 plus BUN over 2.8. The main thing here is it's two times the sodium. So we can infer if the sodium is low, it's likely our serum osmolality is also going to be low because sodium's acting as a surrogate marker of osmolarity. And why is osmolarity being low a problem? Because we know what that can do. That can cause fluid to shift into brain cells, making the brain swollen, making the patient confused, and can lead to death. When approaching hyponatremia, we have to split it three ways. And we'll start with the first one. You can have an instance where even though the sodium is low, the osmolarity is still normal. This happens in two instances, and it's labeled pseudohyponatremia, when you have too many hypertriglycerides or immunoglobulins floating in the plasma. Let's explain why. This is the aqueous phase of someone's blood in a BMP. Your BMP machine is already programmed to know that 8% of that component is always triglycerides or immunoglobulins. There is an instance, however, where there's more of them with hypertrig or hyperimmunoglobulins, and maybe let's say it takes up 20% of that component now. Then in a normal instance, the BMP machine knows that that's just water. But in a, someone who has 20%, it's assuming that part right there is water, even though it's not. That's not plasma. That's triglyceride or immunoglobulin. But the BMP machine does not know that. It's still assuming that component's water. So whenever you're adding more water into that equation and it thinks it's more than there really is, what does that do to your concentration of sodium? Makes it go down. That's how pseudohyponatremia works. There's other in times and instance where you have a high osmolarity in the plasma, greater than 285. We know this commonly happens from glucose, and there's a nice little thing to remember for this. Call it the sweet 16. Add 1.6 to sodium for every 100 of glucose over 100 to correct. Second are drugs like mannitol and sorbitol. Thirdly, IV contrast agents can do this. After they've gotten a CT, you check a BMP, it might be low. And then glycine irrigation. Lastly is the one that we care about. This is someone who has a low serum osm, and this is labeled true hyponatremia or hyporosmolar hyponatremia. So after we've established true hyponatremia, we then have to go to volume status. And here we'll cover the extremes. Someone who's hypovolemic and hypervolemic. With hypo, we know it's simple. Vomiting, diarrhea, diuresis are the normal reasons for this. And when it comes to hypervolemia, we're accustomed to the conditions that make someone volume up, so to speak. It's usually heart failure, people who have cirrhosis, people who have nephrotic syndrome, and those who have renal failure, whether it's from ESRD or for bad AKI. In both of these instances, the effective circulating volume is the problem here. And in both cases, it's decreased. Now, in hypovolemia, it's simple to see why. In hypervolemia, it's because things have third spaced. In response to this, our body will do what it needs to do to restore volume. It'll kick on the RAS system, and it'll kick on the ADH system. Now, the problem here is that ADH works faster and ADH works better than RAS ever will. Another way to think of it is that RAS is like a science experiment. It's a beaker of salt and water, perfectly going to give you isoosmotic gains in your volume, where ADH is just an indiscriminate waterfall, no salt whatsoever. So when you have a ton more water than you do salt and water, you're just adding net more water, which will make you more hyponatremic. So if you'll remember that in the competition between maintaining volume and osmolarity, volume is always going to win that battle. So again, revisiting volume state with true hyponatremia, we've covered what happens in someone who's hypovolemic and hypervolemic. So let's cover what happens in euvolemia. When it comes to euvolemia, there's quite a few conditions that we can consider. One that's always on the list is endocrinopathies, typically in the form of hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. The next one is psychogenic polydipsia and something that's very closely related to this called beer potomania and or the tea and toast diet. Next is an entity referred to as reset osmostat. Next are some drugs that can cause it. And lastly, SIDH. 
When it comes to endocrinopathies, the pathophys is much more complex than I can just explain here in a short video. The bottom line is there's excessive CRH and TRH. As they go into the pituitary, they can eventually go on to hit ADH receptors in the posterior pituitary, adding more ADH, thus more water. When it comes to psychogenic polydipsia, biripodomania, there's a spectrum of the same thing. Normally, we have a daily solute load presented to our kidneys of 600 milliosms. Once you've exhausted those 600 milliosms presented to your kidney, you can't make urine anymore. So you'll retain all fluids that you drink. So again, let's take the normal instance, 600 milliosms. The most dilute your kidneys can make your urine in response to you drinking a lot of fluids is 50 milliosms per liter in a healthy kidney, which then means that after I've made 12 liters of urine, I've exhausted all of my 600 milliosms and everything else will stay in my body. So it takes 12 liters to consume to make you hyponatremic in a normal state. In someone who's got beer potomania or tea and toast diet, they have much less milliosms presented to the kidneys. It's only 100. They will get hyponatremic after two liters of urine is made. So anything drank after that, they'll get hyponatremic. So here, it's always an issue of how many milliosms someone can present to the kidney, how much they drink to overwhelm it. With drugs that cause hyponatremia, there's a long list. Here are just some of the more common ones. Just remember anything that's a diuretic or anything that does anything to your brain chemistry can do this. There's also PPIs and opiates on that list. When it comes to SIADH, we had to rule out all the other things on this list. And then we know that CNS diseases, not just cancers, pulmonary diseases, not just cancers, nausea, pain, and stress are all potent triggers for ADH release. So in summary, what we need to remember is that sodium really is a surrogate marker of your serum osmolality. That's why it's so important. That's why when it's low, we assume osmolality is low. But we need to confirm that that osmolarity is actually low. So you have to check the lab test, serum osm, to verify that it is actually low and you're dealing with true hyponatremia. Once you've done that and you've verified that you have true hyponatremia, you have to check someone's volume status knowing that in both low and high volume states, you have decreased effective circulating volume and you have to restore euvolemia in order to turn off ADH and then shut off that waterfall, so to speak. We have to also remember it takes a lot of water to evoke that someone had psychogenic polydipsia. Their urinosum will always be less than 100 because it has to be maximally dilute. And always remember with SIADH, we exclude all the other causes and your urine osm should be anything above maximally dilute, which is telling us that ADH is on board. Please, in the comment section below, leave any of your questions, concerns, or anything else you wanted to add, and drop ideas for other videos if you have them.